So today, it is still addiction must fall, so winning the battle against our giants. But we recognize that we are not actually the ones slinging those stones. We're not the ones fighting the battle. It's actually God, it's actually Jesus who will win the victory for us. So last week, I, I would like to highlight something that Pastor Martin actually shared in his preaching. He mentioned that addiction is actually very dangerous because it's actually very much connected to idolatry. Because come to think of it, when you're addicted to something or even someone, you cannot stop thinking of that thing or that someone. Your whole world revolves around that thing. Your schedule is aligned to that thing. All your effort, your time, your energies. Binubuos natin. We just shower it with everything that we have, that particular addiction. And once we do that, tama nga naman. It's really idolatry. We're now putting our focus on something or someone na dapat kay God. Our focus should be on God, but it's now going to something or someone else. And that's why addiction is connected or is the same as idolatry. So when I heard that message from last week, I got to think, ano ba yung mga addictions ko? What are my addictions? Especially when I was growing up. So let me share some things with you that I was addicted to. Okay, so here are some of them. So growing up as a kid in the Philippines, because I love playing games. So we have there your jaw limbs. Some of you are smiling. You experience that. Diba? Down on the ground. You have your knees, your hands so dirty. But it's fine because you're ka yan, yung mga ganon. And then you have the sipa. If in case you haven't tried sipa, you try it out. It kind of hurts sometimes. Diba? It's a very nice game. And over here, especially if you're in somewhere in my generation, so if it's late at night, and then if it's brown out, the only light you see outside will be from the moon and the stars. So perfect environment for tagu-taguan. Perfect situation for hide and seek. I love this game to the point that I would strategize. Even after the game, while I'm in school, alam ko na, later we will play this game again. Where will I hide? It really goes into my head. And even the game up, up there, can you identify what that is? Text! Ang galing. So we now know your generation. Texts are small cards, maybe around this size. And then usually, the game goes, you have some cards, you have your own card, you have the card of your kalaro or your opponent, and then you let them fly. And when you let them fly, and then they land on the ground, then you, sometimes you even say, chub cha. And then you have your taya, you have your bet. Oh, I, I remember I'm going from one street to the next. Then I will bring stacks or dangkal ang tawag doon. Sang dangkal! Sang dangkal, yun yung bet. And when I win, I get your dangkal. And my world as a kid revolved around these games. So honestly, I can say, oh nga no, I was an addict. I was an addict. I was addicted to these games. But of course, obviously, nakamove on ako. I have let go of these games. But upon reflecting, even though I have moved on, and I hope a lot of you have moved on from these games already, you actually don't defeat addictions. They just evolve. They just change. They get replaced. Old addictions get replaced by new addictions. And for my case, since I love games, my addictions transform into this. Instead of playing on the streets, I will play at home. Video games, you have your Mario over there, StarCraft over there, Counter-Strike, this is a mobile game called Clash Royale, this is the, my most recent addiction. I was a humanities graduate back in the Philippines, but I consider myself as a Counter-Strike major. I know every single map that we play, I'm so competitive, the, all the guns there, it consumed me. My time, money, I will not eat lunch. It didn't matter if I have a test, a homework, I have to play Counter-Strike. It was that bad. But I never realized it until afterwards that I gotten over it. So those are some of my addictions. Probably some of you are thinking, yeah, ako rin, brother. I'm also addicted to some of the games. But some of you are thinking, nah, I'm not, I'm not a gamer. I, I, I have no addictions like that. But probably, the next set of images will be something more of a relatable topic for you, and it's this. And based on your reaction, it is more relatable. Rabe, extra rice. Back in the Philippines, I'm not sure if you have isaw here, but back in the Philippines, isaw, so cheap, so good. 
so bad for my liver, but I don't care. Junk food. My wife and I, we love Cheetos so much. And back in the Philippines, we thought that we were milk tea addicts. But when we got here in Singapore, there was another level. The Singapore bubble tea is another level. So we love bubble tea. I am addicted to these things. And they just keep on coming back. And based on some of your reactions, most likely you are also addicted to some of these things. Or if you did not see your addiction somewhere in the images, you have your own addictions. But maybe the question here is, does, does this mean that it's a sin to have extra rice? <laughs> is it a sin to, to, to buy a koi milk tea? Not really. But let me warn you, let me warn you that every single time we play a video game, we download an app, we post something on Facebook, every time we consume something of like this, it's always step one. And then you like it, then you do it again. Step two. Until you don't realize that you're already addicted to it. So th that's just a warning. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to enjoy life. In fact, next week, we're celebrating. We're enjoying. It's nice to enjoy. God wants us to have fun here. God wants us to, to enjoy. But there are limits. There are limits. We have to be careful not to be addicted to these kinds of things. It's not even the big things like drugs or alcohol or pornography. We're not even talking about that. We're thinking of the little things, the day-to-day -day things that we might be addicted to. And today, we will look at this as a form of idolatry. Wow, idolatry talaga? Pagkain ng isaw, idolatry? <laughs> it might be, it might be if everything, if everything in your schedule or life, or even if the doctor says, stop eating that, you're destroying your body, and still, you cannot control yourself. And when you start saying these words, I can't stop thinking of, Cheetos. I can't stop thinking of this video game. Or my day is incomplete without buying this copy from this hawker place. Mawala na ang lahat, wag lang. Whatever that is. You can leave your wallet. You can leave your homework. You can leave whatever. Wag lang ang phone. Diba? You can sometimes find yourself going to the toilet. Bit-bit mo parang yung phone. When it comes to that point, it becomes dangerous. So again, I'm not saying that enjoying life is bad, but if it goes to an extreme that you are now consumed by those things, then this giant over here is probably winning over your life. And that's what we have to be careful of. And today, we will look into that. We will look into that. The simple things that we are addicted to and what God has given us so that somehow we have a way to fight or combat the giants that we have. I would like to share to you uh, some, an excerpt of this book. This book is entitled The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is the author of The Chronicles of Narnia. Very, very good author. The premise of this book, Screwtape Letters, there's this senior devil who is mentoring a junior devil. Because this junior devil was asked to take care of a person. When you say take care, right? tempt that person. So imagine a senior devil, his name is Screwtape, and he is mentoring a junior devil on how to become a good devil. And Screwtape does it through letters. So he would write letters to, letters to Wormwood. Wormwood. Wormwood is the name of the junior devil. So he would write letters to Wormwood giving tips or strategies on this is what you're supposed to do so that you can win your person. I'll show you some excerpts. Very, very interesting to reflect on. So, this senior devil tells Wormwood, the junior devil, you no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. No need for very interesting things. No need for big things to distract this person of yours. Just give him some old advertisements. Or maybe in today's age, just give him a couple of old Facebook posts or Instagram posts just to distract him from praying, distract him from working excellently or from having a good rest. 
He continues, you can make him waste his time. Not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations that he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. Maybe in today's age, commenting on someone's post, you don't even know that someone, but you just want to comment. You just want to argue back and forth. Ang dami nag sa Facebook, and sometimes they forget what the argument was all about, but they just want to comment and fight. You can waste his time doing that. You will say that these very small sins, these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. So parang, the senior devil is comforting the junior devil. You're too bothered thinking of murder, of adultery, of big sins. No need, no need. You just need the small ones. You just need the small ones. That's enough. That's enough. Because the point is, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate man from the enemy. Who's the enemy here? God. The enemy of the devil is God. So, screw tape, the senior devil is telling the junior devil, as long as you're able to separate man from his God, whatever it is, if it's just a silly Facebook post, is it a cat video or a dog video that you, that you give him over on Facebook, that's enough to distract him. It doesn't matter how small the sins are provided that they, their cumulative effect as they, as they accumulate, they go through steps one, two, three, four, five, repeat, repeat, repeat. And the effect is to edge man away from the light. But sometimes, ganun lang eh. Ah, entertainment lang naman, brother. I'm just de-stressing. Okay, I'll give that to you. But if you do it repeatedly, perhaps the cumulative effect is that you're already edged away from the light and out into the nothing. That's the weapon of the devil. It's the weapon of our enemy. What do we call something or someone that edges man away from the light? What distracts people from focusing on God? What, what brings us away from God and then this is what you will be busy with? Not God, not loving God. You'll be busy with this. you focus on this. And that's our addiction. That's our addiction. And in a deeper sense, that's an idol. And probably one of the more, more famous images of an idol is this one. That's the golden calf. Big problem for the Israelites. And it didn't stop there. They kept on complaining, grumbling. They didn't trust God anymore as they journeyed from Egypt towards the promised land. And our conversation today actually revolves on this journey of the Israelites and one particular part where Moses actually encourages them on what they're supposed to do. And I hope it encourages us as well. So what do we do with these addictions? What's the solution now? God gives us the way out. And today, we want, I want us to wrestle with this idea that idols fall when you love God with your all. These idols, the addictions that we have, how do we actually combat them? How do we counter them? They will fall when you love God. And I think the key there is all. When your entire being is focused on loving God, then the idols will fall down. The idols will not be able to enter your life. The title of today's conversation is There's No Space. Because the premise here is, if you're giving your all, your entire being to God, who deserves it, then there's no space for idols to come in. There's no space for addictions to come in. There's no space for anger, for fear, and every single giant there is, there's no space for them to come in. And you will see there, this conversation is about the Shema. Probably some of you are thinking, ano yun? What's the Shema? We will talk about the Shema. That's actually verses 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy 6. You've heard of this before. At least what the Shema is. Probably just didn't realize that the name of these verses is the Shema. So today's conversation, we will be learning words. We'll be learning four words that are included in the Shema and how Moses actually used them to encourage the Israelites as they entered the Promised Land. I would like to give credit first to the Bible Project. A lot of the images that you will see today and the thoughts and insights that I will share with you today, I got from the Bible Project. Amazing ministry. 
You can find them thebibleproject.com or just search Bible Project. They produce amazing videos that will help you study God's Word and appreciate the Bible in a deeper way. Let's give a background first of the book of Deuteronomy. If you open to the Old Testament, the first five books are called the Torah. And so five books attributed to Moses. Deuteronomy literally means second law. So if you literally translate the word Deuteronomy, it means second law. If you've tried reading Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, very exciting but lots of laws, lots of things there that we might not be able to relate to. So after reading Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, when you reach Deuteronomy, you will see a lot of things repeated. You will see a lot of things na Moses mentioned this already in Leviticus or Exodus or Numbers. Why is he mentioning it again? How come Moses needed to repeat this? Here's the context. The Israelites were slaves from Egypt. God set them free from slavery. They were walking, traveling, journeying from Egypt towards the promised land. What happened along the way? God provides, the Israelites complain. God provides again, the Israelites complain. God provides again, the Israelites complain, they grumble, and a lot of exciting things actually if you, if you read through those books, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. But then, along the way, it took them so long. And because of all their grumbling, a lot of the Israelites that came from Egypt, they've died. They grew old and died already along the way. So, by the time they reached Deuteronomy, by the time that onti na lang, promised land na, onti na lang, just, we will just cross a little bit and that's a promised land, Moses was already leading a new generation. So, this, this generation is actually the toddlers or babies from Egypt pa. Lumaki na sila. They already grew old. So, Moses found it very important that I have to repeat what I taught the Israelites from before. Because this is the new generation. Their parents failed. Their grandparents failed badly. I have to make sure that before they enter the promised land, before they enter Canaan, they're ready. Because you know what will happen when they enter the promised land? The people there worship many, many gods. So Moses wanted to make sure that this new generation is ready to have one God, Yahweh, who brought them out from Egypt, and when they enter there, they will be faithful to Yahweh and they will not be influenced by the many gods that they will see inside the promised land, inside Canaan. So that's why Moses had to repeat the law again, the rules again, the covenant relationship of God and Israel. Spoiler alert, Moses dies towards the end of the book and he is replaced by Joshua as they enter the promised land. So that's the background of Deuteronomy. One highlight, and we will focus on this now, one highlight of Deuteronomy is in chapter 6, and it's called the Shema. So I brought this up earlier, and you're again wondering, ano ba tong Shema na to? Here we go. The Shema is this. Very, very familiar words, most likely, if you've been atten attending church for quite some time, you already know this, and a lot of people will say this, that love the Lord your God, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The Shema is so important in Jewish tradition, in their culture from before, that even up to now, if you would ask a Jew, they would know this. They recite this day and night. They're even required to write it down, to memorize it, to pass it to the next generation. And take note, Jesus himself is a Jew. He has parents, Mary and Joseph, who were both Jews. Therefore, Mary and Joseph taught this to Jesus himself. And as you will see towards the end of this message, Jesus gives a lot of importance to the Shema. And that's why it's nice to study it today. So, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So when you say Shema, that's the prayer. As Moses instructed the Israelites to recite day and night, to meditate every single day of their lives so that when they enter the promised land, they're ready. They're ready and they're focused on the Lord, one God. So to appreciate more what the Shema is really all about, we will dive in 
in a very deep way, the four words you see there. One on top here, heart, soul, and strength. Let's begin. We will look at how they were, or how the words appeared originally in its Hebrew origins. And you actually heard one already, and it's the Shema. Here was translated from Shema. Okay, so Shema is translated in today's Bible as here. And you will see this word here or listen many, many times in the Bible. You know, what does this mean? What does Shema actually mean? It's not just sound waves entering our ears. It's actually paying attention. It's more of responding. So when you're saying Shema, I'm not just asking you to listen. I'm asking you to pay attention. I'm asking you to respond. But even more interestingly, the word Shema means both listen and obey. In fact, in ancient Hebrew, there's no separate word for obey. So if you wanted to write down obey your parents, you can actually say Shema your parents. And that means two things. You listen and you obey. Because they assume that when you say listen, you're obeying at the same time. Sabay yon. Let's illustrate it this way. I'm a parent. I have two kids, one seven-year-old and one four-year-old. If you're a parent, you will kind of understand what I will be talking about. This is a common picture in our house. Toys all over. And I'm the one in charge of cleaning the house. So I am in charge. And when my kids play like this, it hurts me. It hurts me because I'm vacuum ko lang eh. But, but there, there are times wherein I, will, I, I want the responsibility to be with my kids. So I will say, Anya, Odric, after you play, you have to pack away. You have to fix your stuff. You have to put them in their proper boxes. And that's what we do, diba? as parents. We give them responsibility. They will usually say, yes, daddy, I will do it. Okay, so I leave them to be responsible, go to the kitchen, maybe cook, and then after I do some cooking, and then I go back to the sala, I go back to the living room, and what do I see? The same. No change at all. Usually, you, and you know this if you're a parent, you will say this, you're not listening. But to be technical about it, they listened. They heard you. They heard your words. But why do we say you're not listening? Because they did not obey. And that's the power of the Shema. When you say Shema, you're not just listening, you're not just hearing my voice, you're actually obeying it. So when Moses said, Hear, O Israel, that means you listen and you also obey. You do what you've heard. You do what was commanded. And today's message is exactly like that. We're saying that we love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. But if you do not respond and you do not obey, that's not Shema. Here's the second. Heart. So it says there, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It was translated from the Hebrew word, Lev. Parang love, no? Pero Lev. I love you. So Lev. Ano ba ibig sabihin ng Lev? So let's go back to its Hebrew origin. Ano ba ibig sabihin ni Moses when he said, Love the Lord your God with all your Lev. They believed before, in ancient civilizations, that the heart is the one that sustains life. Makes sense. And even today, we know that. We know that. That the heart is the one that sustains life. But interestingly, it's more than that. They thought that the heart was the one responsible for emotions, but also intellect. Some of you are wondering, intellect, di ba? Brain yun. Bakit not love the Lord your God with all your brain? Because back then, they thought that the brain here was just a squishy organ and they had no idea what it was for. They believed that all emotions and intellect was here. Was here in the heart. That's why when the Old Testament writers would say, create in me a pure heart, they don't just say heart, emotions, but also intellect. And because the intellect is included, it involves decisions, choices. Do I choose to do this or do that? That's not the responsibility of the mind. That was their belief back then. It was the responsibility of the heart. Moses says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It actually means both feelings and your logic. What the, your emotions and your decisions. It's together. You take them 
together. So it's nice to go back to the original meaning because you get to appreciate, ah, that's what Moses meant when he said that to the Israelites. Back then, when you say, I love the Lord, our God, with all of my heart, it includes your emotions, but it also includes how you decide. Shouting out puso is pretty much useless if you cannot make good choices. If your logic doesn't lead you into loving God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not just emotions, not just feelings, but also the way you think, the way your logic works, the way you conclude things, the way you decide. Two words na. We have two Hebrew words that we have discussed so far. Shema. Third one is soul. So we say, love the Lord your God with all your soul. Originally, it was nefesh. Nefesh. Probably this is one of the most interesting translations because nefesh, back in ancient Hebrew, it literally means throat. So imagine, if we translated it very literally, we would have said, love the Lord your God with all your throat. What does that mean? What does it even make sense? But come to think of it, it's very deep because what do you need to do to sustain your life? You eat, goes to your throat. When you drink, goes to your throat. When you take in oxygen, you breathe, it goes to your throat. It's as if this writing tells us that the throat is equivalent to your living physical being. The, the, the problem in, in looking at loving the Lord your God with your soul, there, there's this misconception that the soul is just a, a non-physical entity inside us. And when we die, it splits up with our body. It's not like that. So when you say, love the Lord your God with your soul, it's not love the Lord your God using a ghost <laughs> or using some spirit. It's actually your living, physical being. To illustrate this further, I love how one of the Psalms uses nefesh very, very well. Here's the Psalm. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants. Yung soul jan is nefesh. So my nefesh pants for you, my God. My soul, nefesh, thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? It's so powerful. You know why? It's so poetic. It's a double meaning. How do you feel thirsty? You feel it here. Your throat. But that thirst for God is actually your entire living, not just what's inside, but your entire physical being. You long for God. And when we say, love the Lord your God with all your soul, it's just giving your all to Him. That we're thirsty for Him, that I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, with all of my soul. So, Whenever you say, love the Lord your God with all your soul, don't think of it as a ghost or just a spirit flying, floating. No, it's not like that. The soul is together with the body. The nefesh is the living, physical being that who we are. To be honest, if you look at loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, if you put them together, it's already the complete package. Completo na. Love God with your entire being. And that's what we mean by love God with your all, the idols will fall because there's no more space. If your entire life is dedicated to loving God, why would there be time for addictions to enter your life? Why would there be time for you to be distracted by other things? And you're so focused on loving God. So after looking at this, parang, oh nga no, if there's no space for other things in my life, then I can really love God with my entire being. And idols fall when you love God with your all. If you give your all to God, there's no more space for any other addictions to come into play. But wait, there's more. There are four words, diba? Shema, you have your uh, lev, you have your nefesh, and there's one more. The last one is strength. Okay, first time I heard, love the Lord your God with all your strength, Ah, dapat mag-work out ako. I have to go to the gym, build my muscles. That I have to be excellent for the Lord. Look at my body. I'm loving the Lord my God with all my strength. Sorry, that's not the right way to understand it. Kasi if it's just about the physical body, Nefesh already explained that. Why bother to put another one? 
Why bother to put another word? Strength. It was translated from the Hebrew word ma'od. Very, very interesting word, especially in Hebrew. It appears so many, many times in the Hebrew Bible. And it's very useful because it's not just one thing. It's not a part of your body. It's actually very or much. It's like it intensifies something. It makes something level up. Very or much. You intensify something or a word to total capacity. So whenever we use ma'od, it intensifies another thing. It intensifies another thing. It increases the capacity of another thing. Here's a good example. In Genesis, after creating the different parts of our universe, God said that what He had made was good. But on the sixth day, when man was made, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. The Hebrew word for very there is ma'od. Is ma'od good? So you can actually tell your spouse you're ma'od beautiful today. Pag talagang super level up, you can even repeat the word ma'od, ma'od. Nice. I love you, ma'od. Oh, my God. So you, you amplify it. So that's the meaning of ma'od. Therefore, ma'od is not a single thing. It's not soul or heart or brain. It's not that. But since it can mean many things, it is translated also in many ways. So it can be mind, it can be strength, it can be wealth. It can mean many things. Whatever can amplify your love for God, that's what ma'od is. Love the Lord your God with all your ma'od, with all your muchness. What what can level up your love for God? That's what strength or ma'od means in this case. Our life today, basically we can more or less summarize what we have, our resources, our time, our treasure, our talents. These are the things we use to amplify what we do. You want to be better at a particular skill? Put more time into it. Put more treasure into it. You want to be excellent in this area or this field of expertise, then use your talents there. You want to serve well, utilize your talents. So when you want to love your God with all your ma'od, you want to level up your God, think about it this way. How can you use your time? How can you use your treasure? How can you use your talent to increase the capacity of your love for our Lord? Or is my time, treasure, and talent reserved for something else. Perhaps that something else is your addiction. And it's sad because a lot of people use up a lot of time, a lot of treasure, a lot of talent just to satisfy that giant over there that promises nothing. So when we love the Lord our God with all our strength, that's what it means. We amplify it. That's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Moses even reminds them, the Lord is one. Isa lang, ha? When you enter the promised land, there will be many distractions there. But focus on one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Idols fall when you love God with your all. Don't give the enemy even a single space to enter your life. The question now here is, okay, kind of get it. I will give my entire life. But does that mean that I'll become a full-time pastor? Sabi mo, Brother Elmer, give your entire life, your time, your treasure, your talent, give it to, to God. Does that mean being a full-time pastor? Being a missionary somewhere else, somewhere in another country? Maybe, if that's how God is calling you to be. But not necessarily. Not necessarily. And I think the perfect way to demonstrate how this is applied, now we're applying this, the Shema, how do we apply it? It's how Jesus applied it. We look at the life of Jesus, and when an expert of the law asks him, what's the most important command? What's the most important law? How did Jesus reply? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Interesting, the translation became mind. But mind also amplifies our love. This is the first and greatest commandment. Probably the the law expert said, okay, you have a point, Jesus. You're right. That's a Shema. You're quoting the Shema. And we're Jews. We, we agree on that. But Jesus wasn't done. 
when he said that this is the first and greatest commandment, he actually added another one that is in equal or parallel weight to the Shema. And some of you are thinking, I know. I know what that next commandment is. And that's what we apply. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So when we say Shema or hear and obey, what do we do? We love God, of course, with our entire being. But we follow Jesus because we love our neighbor as yourself. And Jesus even levels it up towards f- further down his ministry that we love each other the way Jesus loved us. Wow, the, the focus of Jesus is so clear. You don't just love God by reading the Bible, but you have to love others as well. It's love God, love others in a nutshell. If you want to summarize your application, it's love God, love others. We wear it every day. We might not be full-time pastors, and that's fine, but we have to be full-time Jesus followers. It's never a part-time Christian. It can't be a Sunday-only Christian. We have to be full-time followers of Christ. And when our office mates see us, when our friends see us, our classmates see us, the way we act, the way we talk to them, the way we make decisions, the way we, we, we show our emotions, our intellect, the way we decide on things, it should display loving God and loving others. Because if not, then perhaps a giant of addiction is somewhere there taking some space inside you inside us. An idol has taken residence in your person, in your being. I'll illustrate it like this. Some of you are thinking, oh, I know that. I know that. Uh, if you're familiar with this, kabatch, batchmate, batchmate. Yeah, so we're pro- probably in the same generation. This is my very first phone. For the younger generation, they're, what's that? That looks weird. Yeah, that's a phone, okay? That's a phone. Key features of the 6150 from Nokia. Rubber keypads, fashionable antenna up there. Even if you drop it a hundred times, it still works. <laughs> it works. A small screen like that. And it can store up to 10 messages. <laughs> Imagine, you probably forgot that time, no? Now when you're in box, it becomes so full so fast. Well, back then, when I owned this phone, whenever people send me quotes, oh, yung ganda ng quote, I'll save it. Oh, yung very nice message, I'll save it. If, a, if, a, if my crush will message me good morning or good night, kahit yun lang, I'll save that. Uh, sa inbox ko yan. But then, as you keep on saving nice stuff, this one appears. <laughs> there was no space for new messages. So, hindi ko natanggap yung text mo. I didn't receive your text because there was no space for new messages. Because I kept so many things. So, uh, I have to receive this message. Uh, I need to delete. Uh, what do I delete? What do I remove? Uh, ito na lang yung message ni mommy. Okay, sige. Uh, okay. Uh, itong crush na to, hindi naman ako pinapansin ito, delete. So, you think, you think which one to delete. And that's the message today. We are full of messages. We are full of messages, maybe here from this church, from the world, from YouTube, from Facebook. Which ones do we delete? I hope we delete the ones given by that giant over there. The message that, oh, just do this game, you'll be so satisfied. Oh, just eat this food, you'll be so happy. And when you're addicted, but they fill up your messages, your inbox, and you have to delete some of them. Start deleting some of them so that you can make some space for God who truly deserves it. And when your inbox, when your life, when your entire being is just so full of loving God and loving others, you can honestly say this, no space. For addictions, no space for giants, no space for idols. Even if the world tempts me, I can say there's no space for them. I only have space for God's grace. That's the only space that I will leave there because I know that when Jesus is in my life, then these giants, giants over there, will fall. Any idols will fall. So right now, brothers and sisters, think about it. What's occupying your life? Is it your work? Is it, your, uh, is it someone? Is it a game? An app? I, I don't know what it is for you, but if that space is occupied by an idol, get rid of that idol. Here's a challenge. Fill our day with actions that love God and love others. Some of you have planned your Monday to Friday already. It's Sunday right now. 
So try to look at your to-do list. How does this task number one help me love God and love others more? If it doesn't contribute, maybe delete that message na. Or so sometimes it get, makes it worse. Delete that already. Remove that. Remove that to-do list. Or maybe, Brother Elmer, but I have a work. I have a job that requires me to be present in my office 9 to 5, 9 to 6. That's fine because you can put a spin into it. If your to-do list is be in the office and you have no choice but be in the office, then be excellent while you're in work because when your office mates see you and you're excellent in your work, they will start to wonder, what's with this person? He's so excellent. He is full of integrity. And that's how you apply loving God and loving others. And perhaps it, makes, it gives you an opening to invite someone from your office and then have a conversation, have a relationship with that someone and eventually share Jesus with that person. It's always intentional with us. If you're a follower of Christ, it's always intentional. Whatever you do, for example, if it's a routine for you to grab a cup of coffee before you commute to work, then perhaps you change it a little bit. I'll grab a cup of coffee, but this time I will invite this neighbor or this friend of mine, and then I'll establish a relationship with that person so that eventually, maybe I can share the gospel with that person. You can put a spin into the daily things. Don't say that you're too busy because we are full-time Christians. We always have Christ in mind. We always have Jesus to be shared to other people. And once we're so full of loving God and loving others, idols fall for sure. Idols fall when you love God with your all. So what are your idols today? What's occupying that space in your heart? What's occupying that space in your soul, in your mind? What's, what's there? You have your own addictions that need to be crushed. And don't worry, it's not by your own effort anyway. It's by Jesus Christ. If you let the grace of God enter your life, truly the idols will be crushed.